Welcome to another episode of FC Office, where we talk to people who are daring to live differently. I don't know about you, but when I say the words freelancing, remote work, I tend to think about the more traditional jobs that we see pop up online. These can be things like uh, virtual assistants or graphic design or, or even uh, web design and coding. But it turns out there's a whole other world out there where people are doing super creative jobs from their home. And in this week's episode, we're talking to Lisa Shufro. She is a curator and conference designer and also happens to be the former producer of TED Med. So she is the real deal. We had a really fascinating talk about nonconformity, how that helped shape her freelance career, what it's like to design conferences from home. And we even talked a lot about how to build a global network. Because when you do work from home, your network has to be strong and warm and well connected. So I really think you guys are gonna enjoy this episode. Stick around to the end where Lisa shares a little gem that will help take your networking to the next level. Lisa Shufro, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about, about what it is that you do. So I am a curator for conferences and I sometimes uh, do the simple entry by saying, uh, if you've ever seen a keynote talk, I'm a specialist in the keynote talk. And, um, and what it is is, I will select what a program should be for an audience. I will find the most interesting speakers, sometimes famous, more often not, because that's a special love of mine. Uh, and I get them to tell stories to an audience that um, really explain your brand in a whole new way. Where, tell us where we can find some of your work, actually. So um, I was the curator of uh, TED Med, the head of programming for TED Med, which is TED's um, medical spinoff for about three years. So you can find the talks that I helped curate um, between the years, I think, of 2012 and 2014. Uh, and, or sorry, 2011 and 2013. Uh, and then I went to Las Vegas and uh, helped out with the Life is Beautiful Festival in the year 2014. Uh, since then, I've been traveling around the world uh, helping conferences uh, that would like to have a special spin on their programming. Uh, it includes the next Einstein Forum, which is about the top young scientists in Africa, uh, the Global Young Academy, um, and the Emerge uh, Music Festival in Las Vegas this past year. I helped with their inaugural event, and I have more coming um, in this coming year. So my specialty is conferences, first-time conferences. That is so incredible. And I, this is something that I think when people hear the terms remote work or work from home or just working out of an office, this is something that I think nobody thinks of. You know, if you were to Google right now something traditionally that's out of an office, you get things like retail, farming, which is true. It's out of an office, but you're doing something so creative and next level and around the world. Like this is just the most incredible thing I've ever heard of. Well, I love fairy tales, I love stories, I love ideas, and ideas are from everywhere. So um, I, I'm very lucky that technology has enabled me in the last couple of years to access ideas around the world and make friends around the world who sometimes want to put their ideas you know, in next level format. So um, as long as I have Wi-Fi and a laptop uh, and you have an idea or a story, there's no reason why we can't connect. Uh, even though even though the final product is a, an event in person, right? The live experience is, but all the build up to it is something that can be built um, just with the right uh, telecommunications connection. <laughs> I love that. And so let's back up a little bit. So tell us, even before you started jet setting around the globe, tell us why you decided to F the office. Like, what was your title? <laughs> um, I, I won't say that it was an obvious choice. I mean, I, I did go kicking and screaming into letting go of the steady paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and you know, it was raised that you, you know, you get a steady job and you climb. Um, yeah. But something that I had found um, was that I was always a nonconformist. And there was a certain level that I was very successful at within the companies uh, that, that I was hired. And they were, you know, 
by corporate standards, fairly nonconformist too, but I was always <laughs> rushing towards the fringe of whatever hadn't been figured out, whatever, you know, there was no established process where I was just always in the thick of that because I oh, was- Oh, I love it. You're so, like a moth to the, the fringe flame. <laughs> always going to the edge of conformity because that's where I felt the best. Um, and at a certain level of having consistent success within the organizations I was in, a very natural thing happens. You are naturally thinking of rising up within the organization and there is increasing pressure to conform. Oh, interesting. Either, I think that can happen either because, you know, the executive team wants you to be like them and to demonstrate characteristics like them. And so suddenly your differences get held, you know, in a different kind of scrutiny about whether you're worthy. And that downward pressure, I think, extends to everyone. But I was particularly um, uh, bothered by it. <laughs> I was particularly stubborn about hanging on to things which, you know, um, felt dangerous to an organization, which in turn, you know, some of the companies that uh, I was working for, even though they were independent satellites and very creative and nonconformist, they were often um, owned by parent companies that had the same downward exerting pressure of we can't afford to take a risk because we have stakeholders and we have salaries and payroll. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think at the point at which I was really growing to what I felt was next level of leadership, um, I had two choices. I could either conform and almost subvert from within the system or I could create a new. And um, that in the end, wasn't much of a choice either. That was just sort of, I felt I had gone to the extreme of corporations or organizations that were very creative and had all the right philosophies and I was still, quote, too creative. In fact, I was even told creativity is a dirty word. And that was sort of like the, well, I'm out of here. Um, wow, yeah. Thing, you know, well, don't use that word, you know, use these business words. And that irritation for me was so strong um, that actually the first time I, I thought about maybe I should strike out on my own, um, my mentor said, you're not ready. Um, and then I went to another mentor and she said, you're not ready either. Um, <laughs> and that turned out to be incredibly good advice. I had experience, but I didn't um, actually have the right network that enabled me to survive on my own. Oh, I was going to say, I'm really surprised to hear that then you had two people say, you're not ready, which to, to me, I think there's this belief that if you have a passion and an yeah. idea, just go with it and well, you're ready I to go. I like the answer. And, you know, could I have tried on my own? I think I absolutely could have. I just think it would have been a much harder path. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that my path was easy. <laughs> 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 I'm just saying that although I think I had very good experience and a pretty um, solid idea after 10 years in corporate um, and, and some real projects under my belt, I think I knew what I was good at, um, but I didn't know how to articulate it and I didn't have a network um, that could help me identify what was the marketplace. Um, it's just still a problem for me to articulate clearly because I'm still attracted to the fringe. But <laughs> yes, it's ever evolving. Except I love what you said about you're building your network, yes. and I can imagine that as a global curator, your network has to be really strong. So here, here's my question: mm -hmm. Is that it's hard enough when you are working online to maintain a network to the point where? you're on the next level with these people. Like these are long-term relationships that you're curating yeah. so that you can work with them. You can build conferences with them. How the hell do you do that? How do, how do I build those kind of relationships? Yeah, how do you build those relationships? How do you keep them warm? How do you do that? It's next level. It's, this is a next level network because everybody is global. You know, you, you can't necessarily go to a bar and say, let's catch up for a drink. I haven't seen you in three months. This is a you're halfway around the world, what have you been up to? So I think what ends up happening is that the process of articulating your big idea in 18 minutes or less, which is the famous TED format, um, is so scary to high achievers that if you can create an environment of safety and trust quickly, um, and you can also establish that the alternative perspective can add value to their performance, most high achievers will take the open hand. 
And in the process of uh, building a kind of what I call Jerry Maguire-like relationship (laughs) um, that um, you get to know the person as a whole, not just in the performance of their talk. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that all of the relationships that I've developed in the course of my work result in daily friendships. Mm. But um, it's not unlike the kind of relationship you develop with a colleague in the office, Mm -hmm. because the kind of uh, process you've built together is really, is founded on on a strong relationship where you can say anything and feel heard. I can say anything and you may decide that that's a value for you. Some portion of those relationships turn out to be years long. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when it did come time for me to strike out on my own, um, I had developed in some ways the quote asset that I had developed was uh, a, a, a network where I could call someone who was at the height of their industry, the height of their field of research, the height of their creativity, um, and ask them a question about what was really going on um, in the field from their perspective. And that was the, 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 the core platform for me to build on. So what is very unusual about my career is that I'm not a specialist in health. I'm not a specialist in marketing. I'm not a specialist in any of these things. Um, I have been successful at asking questions across industries uh, about storytelling And so I have a comfort level with um, going to any kind of industry and figuring out what the discussion is in that industry and finding the people who can um, can share that, in part because um, I have developed over the past eight, ten years great people to ask stupid questions of. (laughs) (laughs) I I mean, I wouldn't say they're stupid questions because what you're talking about is a whole higher level of dot connecting and it's very intimate these relationships that you're building there's a well, whole other you know, they don't all relate to that but that's i think what i realized that for me quality over quantity oh i like that yeah there's definitely um a, a a path to success where people meet as many people as possible and it's a numbers game and we see that in dating and we see that in networking mm-hmm that in some ways conference hopping. Sure. Uh, and dating and networking are really not that different if you think about it. <laughs> uh, no, they're not. What you got for me, what you got for you. Do you smell good? Okay. Um, but um, for me, and I think it is because of the introversion, I would go to these conferences and feel overwhelmed and insecure and everybody was so much smarter. Uh, and um, I would look for the one or two relationships where there was a real resonance and a, and a possibility of a deep conversation. And it was actually Susan Cain who wrote the book on introversion, Quiet, who was like, that's okay. That, you know, made me stand up and cheer and feel great about that process. And so for me, what was more successful than being the honeybee um, was to develop one or two high quality relationships. And good people tend to know good people. And that was the platform that I was able to build and leverage into um, global usefulness. And so while a traditional path to success or a common path to success in this F the office digital nomad world might be, you know, pump your social media and have your LinkedIn and pump up your website. I actually was painfully late in getting my (laughs) website together. I am more of a lurker on social media. Uh, I'm one of those people who's like, oh, you should be doing this. And I'm like, but I don't have the time because I'm actually just too busy talking to awesome people all day. But I think you're tapping into something that's really universal. And it's that I think a lot of people go into this lifestyle, remote lifestyle, and think, I do have to have a fully fledged social media page or LinkedIn or website. And, and the truth is, a lot of networking is built on those close, intimate relationships, even if you're networking with just one or two people that yes. resonate with you. So I think you're tapping into something that goes beyond the advice that's already out there nowadays for people, which is have a presence. And you, I love what you're saying. I'm hearing that necessarily you don't necessarily have to have that huge presence online. It's more about crafting those those connections. Yes. Yeah, and I think it is about being selective about who you spend your time with. And I think the metric that I am the most proud of about my career path is that I would say I spend less than 5% of my time with people I'm not genuinely happy to be with. Mm-hmm. And for me, that was a huge relief 
from doing the conference hopping thing where it's like uh, the speed the speed dating three minutes to figure out what you do and whether you're useful for me felt far too transactional. It works for a lot of people. I'm not knocking it. But I think the beauty of what's happened in the workplace since I entered it and since I began my life as a freelancer um, is that the technology uh, enables many models of success. There are dominant models of success. There are the ones that work well for a high proportion of people, um, but for nonconformists like myself. Uh, <laughs> and like me, and so many of our, our efforts, we're still working on the nickname. Nonconformist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, you know, and it went from being a misfit to being a nonconformist, and that went from being a bad word to being something that's possible and doable. And for me, this many models of success was very empowering. Um, and, and, and I have no problems with all the advice that um, other people give me. I probably would do even better if I had a more robust social media presence. I'm not arguing with that. Um, but I just think that that doesn't diminish the path that I've taken. I love this so much. And actually, something else you said. You said technology enables your career, which totally, everything that we're doing now, it's thanks to technology. Um, just curious, what, as a curator, what are the tools that you cannot function without? Like, what, what, what do you use to do your job? Pocket, which is an oh. app <laughs> that allows me to save articles to read later, because in today's day and age, with the saturation of content, um, the ability to say, oh, that could be interesting, this could be here, um, is a kind of a lifesaver. So if I'm you know, traveling on a plane, I can read offline and catch up on a lot of different ideas that are flying by too fast, and it gives me a way to organize uh, articles that may be of interest. It's a pre-sort, um, but it's really fast. It's basically press a button and go. Um, and you can tag it and you can share. So um, I find Pocket to be almost indispensable. Um, I Second tool for me, same thing, because a lot of what curation is is saying, oh, that's an interesting idea that I found here but belongs here, um, are these little, <laughs> it's very geeky here. I can't wait to see what you're grabbing. <laughs> They're um, colored post-it tabs. <laughs> oh, no. I, wow, we're going analog, but I love it. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I, you know, I have my digital things. But oh, yeah. No, I love it. Fabulous about having a physical book and remembering where in the space that it was, but I can't always find the correct thing. Or if I'm, you know, bouncing back and forth between um, speakers. So at one point, you know, I think I was uh, directly coaching or group coaching 192 speakers in a 10 day period that they were all presenting. Oh, my Lord. Uh, and to, you know, fly around in that many topics, like, to flag a book and say, okay, here are, you know, yellow is all the ones that are related to science and green are all the ones that are related to love. <laughs> you know, um, it just makes it a little faster for me to find. And digitally, that's even a little bit harder, but I can flip through a book and go flip, 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 flip. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, the, the, the little colored post-it notes, you know, I feel a little bit naked if I don't have one of those in my pocket at all times or purse. I just care. Anyway, you can find them at Container Store. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, and the third is like um, voice memo. People are always saying um, amazingly interesting things. So um, either I'll have a conversation and I'll ask if I can record um, and then I can transcribe it later um, or I will record my thoughts about a conversation I just had anonymously for anybody I've done this for. I strip out all of the identifying information um, unless I have permission. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll just capture in the moment um, what, it, what I thought was really fascinating about the conversation I had or the idea I just encountered. Uh, because, you know, ideas come to me while I'm walking the dog or getting a coffee or on a train. I don't always have my laptop in front of me. And I'm not always talking to the person you know, that I'm coaching or working with. So um, being able to capture in the moment and then sort, I think is the common theme. That is so cool. And actually, um, kind of related, I just read, I'm going on a tangent for a second. I just read this article about how laziness, not that I'm saying we're lazy when we take breaks, we walk the dog, we have a cup of coffee. But the point was that something that's traditionally lazy, where you're not 
putting an effort into some project is when we have our best ideas. And oh, so there's you, no doubt. I love that. So I love the neuroscience behind that that is not commonly understood. But, um, you know, I think we've been done a great disservice. And part of the F the office movement is getting out of an industrial mindset. We're sitting in a cubicle or a stationary place uh, and work, work, work and measuring everything by productivity metrics. How much stuff are you putting out um, actually forces you to stick to what you know. And so there is, um, there, there is some evidence for neuroscience that when you're doing an activity, you know, you're, and you're doing it repetitively, um, the brain is storing, you know, experience one, experience two, experience three. And then when you stop and you rest and you're not distracted by doing something else, the brain will then decide what to put in long-term memory by comparing experiences and synthesizing. So the learning actually happens when you're not doing something. It, it's a cultural pressure because we, want, we, we are constantly measuring how am I being productive that's actually at odds with how am I doing something new in which you need the time to compare differences between very subtle differences in experience. And then, you know, when not doing something else, the brain will synthesize. But, you know, um, that was the basis of my creative approach, right? Is leave me a lot of room to, um, to, to come up with a different way. And a lot of it, you know, the experience A, B, C, D, E, F, maybe the entire alphabet is not going to yield an output. But the synthesis of experiences and, and very few companies um, feel like they can afford to invest in that. Um, so I determined that there was no single company that was gonna allow me to do that in the full range of my expertise, mm -hmm. which I developed as a musician, where you play it uh, 10,000 times before the time you play it on stage. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> right? And that ratio of success to failure is just a given. Um, <laughs> many business environments are not in a position because of stakeholder growth goals and profitability goals and the metrics we're used to seeing um, ready to invest in that. So instead I beg, borrow and steal from little pockets of innovation <laughs> I can find, um, across clients and I'm much happier and presumably so are they. I 1000% love this and I feel incredibly inspired <laughs> to now not only look at my own connections at F the office, but to allow myself that creative freedom and to invest in a voice memo app because I definitely don't have one. And Oh, you have one on your phone. Oh, yes, good memos. point. Oh, then we do have one. Oh, my yeah, gosh. Yeah, all the time. Lisa, this was a fascinating conversation. <laughs> um, tell our audience where they can find you online now. <laughs> well, uh, probably the, the simplest place is to do lisashufro.com, and um, that is usually where I have the work I've just completed. Okay, perfect. And <laughs> speaking of work that you've completed, as I understand it, you have a course coming out about storytelling, yes. specifically how to find your story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, I think, again, I'm always attracted to the spaces where I don't think there is enough thought uh, put into it. And while I think there's a lot of material out there about uh, the techniques of giving a good talk and how you should stand and how you should dress and uh, how you should prepare, um, I think that the most valuable part of the work is deciding what you're going to say about your unique purpose in life and how a talk can help you express that deepest purpose, not um, the latest work that you've done or the research that you've found, but the real deep questions that explain everything you do. So I hope that this course um, tells you how to find your real talk, your big idea, um, so that all your talks can be easier. I love that. That's so universal too. Only you have that unique talk within you. And I cannot wait to see this course. I can't Everybody. Wait. I think that was the first lesson I learned working in the TED Empire. The founder himself was just like, you know, talk to everyone for five minutes. And what he really meant was go find everybody's genius. Oh, I love that. Everybody has a little nugget of genius in them. At I least five minutes that. of genius. Everyone's got at least five minutes. And once you find that five minutes, you can do all kinds of wonderful things. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Lisa, thank you so much for talking to us today. It was an absolute pleasure. It was my pleasure to any time.
Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode. And for more information about what Lisa does and how she does it, check out the link in the video notes. And for more interesting interviews like this one of people daring to live differently, go to ftheoffice.com. We'll see you on the next one.